Okay, off we go. Showtime. Welcome to the show. I'm Brent Holland. Welcome, one and all. Now, I don't know if you can hear it or not tonight, folks, but a storm just broke outside. There's thunder, there's lightning, and a downpour right across Lake Ontario. It's a great night, folks. You've been working hard all week. Take this time for yourself. Get in your most comfy chair, kick your feet up, get the coffee going, get the tea going, or a beverage of choice. John Barber has been called the godfather of reality TV. Da, 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 da. Not that type of godfather, because John is a Canadian, and as we all know, being a fellow Canadian, we're fantastic people, aren't we, John? You know, I told Ted Sorensen, he said, oh, you Canadians are wonderful people. I said, yeah, till we get a hockey stick in our hand, then we go a little bit Meshuggah. We'll talk about hockey in a second. <laughs> because John is the creator, writer, co-host, and co-producer of NBC's hit TV show, Real People. Now get ready for this, folks, because this is a rarity. John has also won Emmys for both information and entertainment programming. He's also won a Golden Mike Award for broadcast news journalism. And remember that, because that's where we're going to go tonight. This is important, folks. In 1992, John released the groundbreaking documentary, The JFK Assassination, the Jim Garrison tapes. Now, in this documentary, John sits directly across from the legendary real Jim Garrison for an explosive interview. This documentary still stands as the only film that lets the heroic Jim Garrison, district attorney for New Orleans, tell his amazing story in his own words. The film was an award winner in the prestigious San Sebastian Film Festival in Spain. Now, we fast forward to tonight. John has produced a brand new JFK documentary titled The Second Assassination of JFK. And please allow me to read this quote by John that is going to put it all into perspective. The Garrison Tapes, John's original documentary that we just talked about, has been almost totally blacked out by America's mainstream media. The facts that Jim Garrison uncovered about the horrifying crime that changed both America and the world shows exactly why we cannot accept that no one has ever been brought to justice for JFK's murder. It is my great great pleasure to welcome back John Barber. How you doing, my friend? You look great. Brent, thank you very, very much. It sounded like you were doing a a eulogy for crying out loud that is it's wonderful and if we're going to talk about hockey i presume we're not going to talk about the ottawa senators i mean they are colossal disappointment i must tell you when the kings folded and i'm a hockey junkie coming from toronto i grew up on hockey night in canada with foster hewitt nobody will remember this player's name but my favorite player in the leafs was a defenseman named wally stanowski how can i remember that after 70 years for crying out loud, but when the Kings folded. And by the way, I supported the LA Kings when they came here and they only got 2,000 people at the Inglewood Forum. And myself, Matthew Perry's father, John Perry, and an actor named Bo Swenson created the celebrity hockey team, which is still going strong. But anyway, when the Kings folded because they lost quick, which shows you how important the goalie is, I started to support the Nashville Predators, and I must, because I'm always sorted for the underdog, and I must tell you, they did not deserve to win last night over the Ducks, who I played them. They shot them. The Ducks had 39 shots, got three goals, and the Predators had 18 shots and got six goals, but Rennie saved the game for them. Anyway, it's a great, great, there's there's nothing as exciting as playoff hockey. I didn't mean to get off the subject of my film, but I'm really pumped. Uh, me too. I'm looking forward to, ne- to tonight's game as well. It's Game 7, folks. Uh, well, actually, it's sudden death for the Ottawa Senators. And uh, that's what's going to happen on this show, folks. You get two Canadians together, we're going to talk hockey. Deal with it. What can we tell you? <laughs> it's, you know, it's our national sport. It's our national pastime. Actually, lacrosse is our national sport. <laughs> Okay, now the reason why I mentioned very specifically that you received a news award. John, I want to ask you in all seriousness, have we lost trust 
in mainstream media completely. I don't know who to believe, who not to believe, what's fake news, what isn't fake news. There's spin coming from everywhere. I mean, I watch CNN in absolute amazement. It's like I'm watching the Maury show. You get three people on one side, three people on the other, and they all yell at each other. That's not news. What's going no, on? That's, the, this new documentary is the definitive film on the entire history of the murder of John Kennedy, who did it, and who protected him. The crime was solved in 1967 when Jim Garrison arrested Clay Shaw. He announced that the crime had already been solved. People who think they know a lot about the assassination of John Kennedy are going to walk out of this film absolutely staggered by what they did not know and what they are going to learn in this film. We had one screening, Brent, on November 22nd at the Texas Theater where they arrested Lee Harvey Oswald. There were 600 people, there were 300 people present. 80% of the, now at the end of the film, it got a spontaneous standing ovation. I, now, I was the film critic for 10 years at Los Angeles Magazine, for five years at NBC in Los Angeles. I was Tom Snyder's uh, sidekick doing the reviews. I was the first one in America to review movies on the news. I have never seen, and I've seen brilliant movies, a standing ovation for a film. This film got a standing ovation. It was, it's just phenomenal. When you see it, and I know you know a lot about this case, you two are going to be blown away. Now, if you want to ask me some of the things that people might learn, and but you know what it was like? It was like the, watching the movie was like going to a Black Baptist revival meeting in Watts on a Sunday. The audience was talking to the film. For example, when Dan Rather came on and he's describing the headshot, and then he's telling the audience, now remember this is the day after it, the shooting, the people had not, America was not allowed to see the Zapruder film until Geraldo Rivera, did, Rivera showed it in 1975 with Dick Gregory and Bob Groton on late night television. So they have to believe that Dan Rather is right when he said the head shot, and he keeps saying three shots, three shots, three shots. That was pre-programmed. Jim Garrison said, and I didn't think of it at the time, he said, elements of the CIA murdered John Kennedy, but they were aided by elements in the media so that the fiction could sink in before the facts were revealed. And the one to do that to us was Dan Rather, who was rewarded later as the $8 million voice of America as the anchor man on CBS. And he talks about his head going forward. Well, the audience in the theater starts booing him in the theater and all of a sudden up pops George Carlin giving Dan Rather the finger and then they cheer and the whole film is like that there are just wonderful now how could you possibly say there are entertaining and funny moments in a movie that is about the the public execution of our president and it's the easiest unsolved uninvested cold crime case in American history as a matter of fact, after the House Select Committee concluded four shots were fired, they turned it over to the Justice Department for, the, for them to investigate it, and they let it, they let it lie there. But I must tell you, what, when I interviewed Jim Garrison, it was September 5th, 1981, and I had first tried to book Jim on the AM show. I had originated the AM show in Los Angeles. So here's something that folks are going to, learn about. I screened this movie for a very prominent uh, woman anchor woman here in Los Angeles who was a lead anchor woman on television, has a major in journal journalism. She's 37 years of age, very, very attractive, an ultra smart. She kept gasping during the movie. And I said, why are you gasping? There's no uh, autopsy because there was no autopsy performed. You're not looking the blood in the president's head. What are you gasping at? And she said, John, I did not know that in 1963 in America, a company could only own five television stations, 
five newspapers or five radio stations. I did not know that there was such a thing as a fairness doctrine. I had never heard of the equal time clause. She says, I am staggered, which proves, amongst other things, as the documentary does, that Bill Clinton, in signing the Communications Act in, in 1993 or 1996, he turned 96% of all American media over to six corporations which are to this day propagandists for the empire. Now, I will tell you how smart Garrison is. Anyway, when I tried to book him, I was like, Jim Garrison had said, you know, I, I believe my government. I was in the military. I was in the Air Force. I had this authority syndrome. Why would the government lie to me? He only doubted the government when he met Senator Hale Boggs accidentally in Washington. Hale Boggs was a single lone dissenter in the Warren Commission. And his dissent is not published. He met with Garrison and he said that old man of Car Carcano could never shoot anything. And that kid was no a shot. So there's more to this than, I'm, than I can say. Garrison went out and bought three sets, three sets of the 26 volumes. He had one in his car, one at home and one in the office, and he memorized it, and that's when he started his investigation. Friend, when I started out as a comic, believe it or not, my mentor and guide was Red Fox, who had a reputation for being filthy, right? His real name is John Sanford. That's why the show is called Sanford and Son, by the way. And, and Fred, uh, uh, he was called Fred because that was the name of his brother who died. Anyway, he had a lot of clean stuff in his act, and a line that he had that I loved, he said, heroes ain't born, they're cornered. Well, Jim Garrison was cornered by the truth of opening his investigation into the Warren Report and discovering that it was all schlock. And I was, now I'm not a hero, but I was cornered because I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I'm a storyteller. When I was a kid, Brent, and I was sort of semi-orphan. I would sit around the radio and I would listen to Lorne Green on CBC telling stories. I would listen to Gordon Sinclair telling stories. I used to read every, I read O. Henry and I was just a kid, Guy de Maupassant. I used to read, to read stories to my, my two and uh, my uh, uh, second and third year class. And I was only like seven year, or eight years of age. I fell in love with words because not having a family, these books and the stories in the books about the people became my other family. I accidentally read Heritage of Stone after Jim lost the case. I was in a bookstore and I discovered he had to take Time Life to the Supreme Court to get the Zapruder film into a courtroom. A, a physician named Zink was brought by Clay Shaw's attorney as a defense attorney to prove that the bullet struck the president in the back of the head. But under cross-examination, the guy's name was Fink. And under cross-examination, Dr. Fink said, I don't know if the president was struck in the back of the head. Now he's under oath in cross-examination. He said, because there was never an autopsy. They wouldn't let me look at the x-rays. They wouldn't let me look at the photos. Well, this is in a courtroom and never made public by the mainstream media. So when I called Jim to book him, he said, you'll never get away with it. And I said, hey, I've won my first Emmy. I thought I was going to win a lot. So I said, I'd won my first. And I said, I just read your book. And he said, oh, you must be the other one because I only sold two copies. Anyway, I booked him on the show. I was fired and he was canceled. So I just thought, well, that's show business. You know, I lost the job. I ended up getting a job as a critic on a local station where I won my sil silver mic. When I talked, it, I did a piece about, you remember the Munich massacre? We used to watch the Johnny Carson show live, the feed from Burbank into New York, friend. And I figured, because my hero in late night television was Jack Parr, by far the best late night host. My news hero, of course, was Edward R. Murrow. There were my two and the reason I love Jack Parr, because I never had conversations with, as a kid, because I never had a family. 
And I would watch Jack Parr, and I thought, he's having a conversation with people. You mean that's how you can earn a living, having a conversation? So that's why I did that. And the reason I went into stand-up, because like Carson and like Jack Parr, they all did a stand-up beforehand. So in any event, they, they were my two years, and I'm getting a little sidetracked. I don't want to get into a whole monologue like this. I ended up watching Johnny Carson the night uh, that supposedly Black September butchered the Israeli athletes. And I was waiting for Carson because I knew Jack Parr would have said something about it. Johnny Carson said nothing. It looked like the Olympics would be canceled. He said nothing. He made jokes about Doc Severinsen's plaid jacket and Ed McMahon's beer drinking. I was so offended. I tore up my review of a movie and I went on the air and ad-libbed what it must be like to be a Jew in the world today. Within a week, there were 5,000 requests for that. Neil Simon called me. They made, an, they made me an honorary Jew and an honorary guardian. And Israel was giving Neil Simon the Heart of Israel Award at the Beverly Hilton Hotel. He called the guardians and he said, I won't appear unless John Barber introduces me. That's when I first met Neil Simon. So as a sidebar, I'll tell you, Neil Simon and Frank Sinatra, for whom I wrote privately for years, were the only two people in show business that ever kept their words to me. That film for two years became the official fundraising film for the United Jewish Appeal and raised $40 million. So somewhere in Israel is a tree with my, with my name on it. So in any event, I forgot all, you know, I'm, I'm still in show business. Tom Brokaw sees me, brings me to NBC where I become their six o'clock critic with, with uh, Tom Snyder. And I accidentally create real people. I accidentally get it on the air, but I knew I did an interview in 1978 with uh, Maury Goldman of the Daily Variety, and I said, this Canadian dropout who's unknown now is going to change the face of American television with what I call the entertainment of reality. It was, Brent, I'm going to tell you the honest to God truth. Everything wonderful that has happened to me in my life has happened by accident. Everything that's been a disaster in my life and a disaster in this country has been really well planned. It's only the accident that paid off. So anyway, it comes 1980, 81. I create real people and I make it the number one show. At one point, we, we got a 50 share. Half of everybody in America watching television was watching our show. We would get 20,000 pieces of mail a week mostly from people contributing stories. They became our researchers. I did a lot about people in Canada. I was up in Toronto when I revisited my hometown. I mean, it was just, it was just thrilling. People ask me now, do I miss the money? No, I don't miss the money. The thing I miss the most, two things I miss the most. I miss getting a good seat in a good restaurant because whenever I showed up, oh, Mr. Barber here, he could be mobbed. It was, your reservation is over here. Or the other thing, Brent, is I loved telling stories and making people happy. That's, I quell when I do that. It just, it, it thrills me to do that. Anyway, I read in the L.A. Times, uh, George Slaughter well, owned real people. But George Slaughter was like, who's the guy that uh, owns the the uh, Dallas football team. What's his name? You know, you, right now? Or... Yeah, Jimmy, isn't it Jones? Okay. So. George Slaughter was the, the Jones of broadcasting. You know, he owned the team, but he didn't know how to play the game. I was the team. I wrote all of those hours. I wrote all of those stories. Anyway, Freddie Silverman, one of the great idiots in broadcasting, do you know, when he became the head of daytime programming at CBS when he was a kid, the first show he canceled was that show, that quiz show, that ended up going to NBC with Peter Marshall hosting Hollywood Squares. He said, this show is never going to make it. That's the first thing when he became a programmer. 
That man never created anything, anything at all interesting or original. All he did, if you look at what Freddie Silverman put on the air, he brought back all the old people. He brought back Lucille Ball. He should bring back because she was an authentic genius. But he brought back the old shows, nothing new. He stole the idea because he had heard that I had had this real people pilot at ABC and they turned it down. So I was out of work and I couldn't get a job because I was persona non grata for the things I said as a critic. I'm going to tell you too quickly, two critic stories that have a bearing on what we're going to talk about. And this has to do with the fairness doctrine. Do you remember a movie called Soylent Green? Charlton Heston. That's, that's right. Okay. Soylent well, Green is people. That's right. It would have to improve just to be dreadful. Okay. Now, as, as Don Rickles knows, it's easier to get laughs when you're attacking people. So it's when it's a bad movie, it's easy for me to get laughs by attacking it. Well, I decimated this film, and I felt so guilty when I got to the end of the review, Brent. I said, you know, folks, I'm beginning to feel guilty about this. A lot of people put a lot of hard work into this film, so I should try to say something nice about it. So I will tell you this, in all honesty, the sets are beautiful. Then I paused for a moment, and I said, but the sets would have even been more beautiful if they'd been placed in front of Charlton Heston. Well, the crew screamed and applauded, which, of course, the news director hated. They didn't want applause on a news show. Well, the producer at Fox sued demanding, because the Fairness Doctrine and Equal Time were still in effect in that year. And he demanded equal time to rebut my review. Well, the California Supreme Court would not hear the case. They didn't think it was important enough. He took it to the Supreme Court in Washington, D.C., and five years later, the Supreme Court ruled on the fairness doctrine and equal time for this producer and said, you will not get equal time because John Barber's reviews are of no public import whatsoever. So I never got the review. So that made me persona non grata with the movie industry and in television. When Tom Snyder got the Tomorrow Show, NBC management called me and they said, during your, during his last show, would you do a review of your impressions of Tom Snyder as an anchor man? And I said, yeah, I would love to. And he's sitting right next to me and it's six o'clock and we're on the air live and my closing line and the review is that I've been here for five years sitting next to Tom Snyder and I must tell you as a maker man he has the kind of personality that gives me the impression and gives you the impression that the news is here to bring you him well the audience cheered again and Time Magazine quoted so when I lost my jobs I couldn't get a job anywhere and I was out of work walking the streets at 46 years of age, just a new father, when I got an accidental phone call that led to getting real people on. But I digress, as I always do, back to Jim Garrison. George Slaughter, who owns the show, gets... Remember the movie Network? One of the most brilliant American movies ever made. And Brent, when I reviewed it, I said, this is the only mover, movie ever that will be made in America that you will go to, to listen to, and not to look at. Every line is an absolute gem, and it's so brilliant, it's almost like a documentary. If you look at it today, it's much more relevant today than it was back in the 70s when it was released. So Freddie Silverman calls Slaughter and says, could you do a TV show that's similar to this, Peter Finch? I'm mad as hell, I don't want to take it anymore. So they, he created this piece of trash called Speak Up America, which one critic called Throw Up America, and it was just dying horribly. And he kept asking me to help him, and I said, no, I can't. I'm 20 hours a day trying to save real people, which he tried to destroy by hiring a 10 or 11-year-old kid named Billingsley, Peter Billingsley, to tell stories. George Slaughter had the worst taste of anybody in television, never had a successful show without somebody who did it for him. Laugh-In, which was only on the air for three years, the greatest, one of the most trend-setting comedies in history, he got jealous because it became Rowan and Martin's show, and it was created by a drunk named Digby Wolf, 
a brilliant Russian uh, English alcoholic. He created the title, he created everything, and Slaughter got to take credit for it. I did the same with real people. George Slaughter only had this on the air for three years because we had an enormous fight over what he did to Garrison, and the show died and it was lost. And yet, the mysteries of show business in Hollywood, he's still part of the what they call the A crowd. How can you be part of the A crowd just because you're rich? Because they, he produces work that is absolute garbage on his own unless somebody else is helping him. Anyway, I agree to, this, to, uh, to do one thing. I accidentally read on page 14 of the LA Times, the House Select Committee concludes four shots have been fired. So therefore, conspiracy existed not only in his murder, but in Dr. King's murder. So I called Mr. Garrison. I said, Mr. Garrison, do you feel vindicated? He said, John, and he had this beautiful Orson Welles voice. He said, I feel like a blind man. who got a very small trophy in a very dark room. Only I know I got, I got it. And then he talks about the media. He said, the media is suppressing this information. All they're doing now is still regurgitating the garbage that was the Warren Commission. The public will not know what is going on because the media has been taken over by Project Mockingbird, created by the Central Intelligence Agency to tra take over the hearts and minds of the American people by taking over all the media so that they can create fake wars, including the fake war with the Soviet Union that we called the Cold War. Because Garrison said they lost, John, they lost 25 million people. They were no military threat to the United States of America. And we all know Vietnam with the phony Gulf of Tonkin, now admitted to, even to McNamara, who should have been in prison along with Lyndon Johnson. And then look at the fake war in Iraq. No weapons of mass destruction. And then we have this dreadful, dreadful, wicked witch of the North, Condoleezza Rice, saying, let's not hope that the smoking gun is an atom bomb. And they make her a member of the Augusta Golf Club where they play the Masters, and they give her, your, give her tenured professorship at Stanford University when she and George Bush should be on the docks as war criminals. John Barber is our guest tonight, folks. We're talking about his new documentary, and it all ties into it, The Second Assassination of JFK. We're talking about how mainstream media veers away from this, and he just mentioned the CIA and the Church Committee, and also the House Select Committee on Assassinations. House Select Committee on Assassinations, folks, was set up in 1976, ran through to almost 1980. Its final conclusion, it was to investigate three assassination attempts. Two of them were successful, one of them wasn't. Whether it was George Wallace, uh, they never came to a conclusion about that one. But the other two they did, surprisingly, Martin Luther King and also JFK. JFK, they found a probable cause, and uh, you're watching it right now if you're watching on television. I'm putting it up. A probable cause for a conspiracy and the same thing with Dr. King. Alarmingly, Nobody has done anything from the government about this report since. I must, I must tell you that William Pepper, as the attorney for the King family, brought a suit against the federal government for conspiracy to murder Martin Luther King. The jury awarded them damages. It was never, ever reported. And guess what else? How many other deaths do you think they, they uncovered at the House Select Committee? I know that was 1998. Go they ahead. discovered... 78 other deaths, some of them crucial to the investigation because three of the people who were supposed to testify were murdered days before they were supposed to testify, and nobody ever looked into it. We have a chapter in the film. The film's title is The American Media and the Second Assassination of President John F. Kennedy because the media aided the CIA prior to Dallas, and all of the media, not just parts of it, all of it, CBS, Time Magazine, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, The Washington Post, and my favorite magazine, The Reader's Digest, all infiltrated by Project Mockingbird and protecting the known murderers 
of the President of the United States, we have a chapter called The Carrot and the Stick. Because when I asked Jim Garrison, Mr. Garrison, why would Jack Ruby order, follow orders to shoot? And Jim Garrison discovered the man who gave Ruby the orders to shoot Oswald. It was a guy named Lawrence V. Myers, and it was easy to track down. His son's in military intelligence. They have a record of him at the carousel meeting with, with, uh, with Jack Ruby. All of this ignored by the Warren Commission, but uncovered easily by simple detective work by, by, by Jim Garrison. I asked him, why would Ruby follow Meyer's orders to go shoot Oswald when he knows he's going to get shot himself? And he said, John, it's the carrot in the stick. And the carrot for him is that he knows the government killed the president and they're going to offer him a job in Las Vegas since they can't go back to Havana where he was the go-to guy for the mafia when they went there to try to get back their hotels. They're going to give him a job in Las Vegas, so he's not worried. He goes and shoots him. It's a piece of cake. He's going to get off. And then, of course, you see Walter Cronkite on the air saying, Jack, uh, Jack Ruby murdered Lee Harvey Oswald to avoid uh, the possible pain of Jackie Kennedy having to come and testify about the murder of her dear husband. I mean, it's just so dreadful. Then we show you what Jack Ruby actually said. He's on camera saying they'll never let me tell the truth. The mainstream media, the government, they won't let me tell the truth. And somebody says, is the truth about higher ups? And Jack Ruby says, yes, it is, that quickly. We show you. We do this chapter about those people who were eliminated, very prominent people, including a person as famous as John Kennedy, and that was Dorothy Kilgallen, who got the only interview with Jack Ruby. And then in the 1970s, the owner of Hustler, Hustler magazine, Larry Flynn, he bought the L.A. Free Press. And you know what he did with the L.A. Free Press? He did two huge editorials. One of them was attacking the mainstream media for not being a free press by not reporting the truth of the murder. Then he offered a million dollar reward for information leading to an arrest and the murder of John Kennedy. And a little while later is shot in the back and crippled for life and never heard from again. So he was one of the sticks. We show not that. And we all showed, also show the number of very prominent carrots, including that dreadful Billy O'Reilly. Billy O'Reilly, in the early days on Inside Edition, he did a great story. He uncovered the names of nine people from the CIA who had infiltrated Garrison's office. Because in the 70s, he wanted to be a star. And it was okay to question the CIA because Frank Church in his investigations, hadn't fully blossomed. We show Frank Church uncovering in the 70s 400 paid assets of the CIA writing and reporting our news. Now, that was in the 70s with the fake Vietnam War. Now, with all these fake terrorist wars, how badly infected do you think America is by the CIA? It is not, America's not the USA anymore. It is the CIA. I'm going to ask you a question. You obviously, know, you obviously know a great, great deal about this because I've listened to you many times with your great guests. You and a couple of other people I listen to are the best when it comes to this subject. Who was the first director of the House Select Committee on Assassinations? I know this answer, and I can't remember his name, but I see his face. Um... Speak not, not um, start with right. an S. Yes, right. It's Richard Sprague. Thank you. Nobody Thank you. will know this. And I'll tell you how this film is blessed. Brent, I'm totally non religious. Okay, mm -hmm. I'm totally non religious because problems I had as a kid. My father came from a very dysfunctional family in Toronto long before it was popular. 1939, my father ran away to the peace and quiet of World War II. I mean, my husband was just an absolute total mess. And around the age of eight or nine, I met a really nice kid named Don Lee. We used to play hockey together. He lived on Scarborough Road across from a church. 
one of the reasons they lived across from a church, they were churchgoers. I went to their house and asked the mother and father to adopt me because I almost never saw my mother. And when my mother came home, she was drunk and she was with another uncle. I must say I had 15 uncles by the time I was 12 years of age. And they all used my mother as a punching bag and a waitress. I was jumping out the window all the time to go to the cops on Main Street to bring them to the house. Anyway, I asked the Lee family if they would adopt me. And what they did is they just gave me a Bible. And I memorized the Bible. I prayed every day for like eight or nine months that I would come home from playing hockey. I would open the door and there would be my father in his uniform. And I did that for eight months. The door opened and there was never anybody there. And I remember I was sitting in church and they were singing. They were singing the Lord's Prayer. And then they started to pray afterwards. I was about nine now. I got up out of the church while they were praying and walked out, sat down on the steps. Well, the minister had seen me. So while the choir was singing, he left them. And bless his heart, he walked around the side, below the stained glass windows and out the front door, up to me sitting on the stair. And he put his hand on my shoulder. Brent, when he put his hand on my shoulder, I almost cried because nobody had ever touched me. Nobody had ever hugged me. Nobody had ever kissed me. I almost cried. And he asked me about why I left. And I was very honest. I said, you know, I've been praying for 89 months and knocking on a door that doesn't open, so I'm not going to knock anymore. <laughs> you know, I'll build my own doors. So he put his other arm around me and he said, John, are you aware of God's will? And I looked up at him and I said, Father, I don't think I'm mentioned in it. Well, he started to smile because he caught the fact that I was making a joke and I didn't even know where it came from. It just popped out of me. Then I realized this was going to be my passport to living a halfway decent, survivable life was creating a sense of humor or reacting with what was a natural sense of humor. And I've done that my entire, entire life. That's why there is so much humor. And I hate to say this in this film. There's so much humor in this film. But I'm going to tell you how powerful this is. This movie is blessed. We've had, for every step backwards, we've had two steps forward. We had a step backward while I was doing this stuff on the House Select Committee. Computers crashing and all that. So I started fishing around for material. And in a place that it shouldn't have been, guess who I found? I found Richard Sprague giving a press conference. Richard Sprague had only, he was a, he was a first appointee. He was a tough Philadelphia lawyer who got great convictions of teamsters and mobsters. Really tough. The first thing he said is, we are going to solve this crime because we are not hiring anybody from the CIA or the FBI as investigators. My staff of six already picked is going to investigate the CIA and the FBI. When Langley heard that, they moved all of their assets in the media and in Congress and in, sec and in the Senate to get rid of Richard Sprague. We have Richard Sprague on camera, and he is ousted for that dreadful sh shill, G. Robert Blakey, G. for government or G. for god-awful. And he writes this dreadful book blaming the mafia. Now, let me tell you, I'm a street kid, and it is very obvious. If the emperor has no clothes, then the emperor should be arrested for indecent exposure. The emperors in the media have no clothes. They were protectors of the murder, murderers of John Kennedy. The JFK Assassination, the definitive book by Brent Holland. From inside the Oval Office to Davy Plaza, first person witness accounts. Order yours right now, nightfrightshow.com. Why this film now, when you have already done the garrison tapes 25 years earlier? Fred, you asked the most brilliant questions. Thank you very, very much. I was waiting for somebody to ask me that question. It never occurred to me until 
the presidential elections last year. And somehow the Republicans dug up their dirty dozen. I don't know where the 1% that owns this country found a deep enough barrel to scrape the bottom to come up with these dreadful, dreadful choices. I mean, the 1% select, and they expect the 99% to elect. Well, we have no choice, That's, and we never will have a choice. We lost control of our government on November 22nd, 1963. And I started to hear all these comments from people like Trump and the rest of them about fake news. And I thought, hey, wait a minute. Where did I hear that expression? And I said, my God, it was Jim Garrison back on September 5th, 1981. Now, I had done a three-hour interview with him. When I did that three hours for Speak Up America, which was a two-parter, uh, which caused the end of my career in television, but which a two-parter, um, it, 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 it was never looked at again. And I never asked him about the media that he talked about because I was a part of it. And I was making an enormous amount of money. I'm embarrassed to tell you because people don't make that every year, which I, what I made in, in, in one hour. Okay, so I forgot about it. But then when I heard these politicians talking about it, I went back and looked at it. Brent, I was absolutely staggered. It, was sound, it sounded like he was talking to me today about the American media. So I thought, I must do part two of the Garrison Tapes. And that's how it started. And, you know, there's a, a very famous writer philosopher named Joseph Campbell, who did this wonderful series called The Power of Myth. He wrote in one of his books, he said, if you follow your joy, and the way he said the way to find your joy, it's just imagine you just won the lottery. You've got all the money in the world. What would you do? What you would do is your joy. Well, you can do that without money. So if you follow your joy, doors in the universe will open as if by magic. And that happened with me when I started Real People. And it happened with me in spades when I started this. Because people I have never met who just were fans on Facebook or from past work contacted me and said, I have a... a, a, a uh, he, he's called our consigliere. He's a lawyer now, 50, year old, 50 years of age, named Brian Lloyd. He's adopted. He's had three heart attacks. From the time he was a youngster without knowing it, he saved everything the media did about John Kennedy. That's how we found the old uh, uh, Los Angeles Free Press items. Uh, that is how we found a lot of the old tapes and a lot of the old films. Well, people showed up from everywhere unseen to me, unknown by me, sending me this magical material. And the one who, who helped me the most is a fellow named Gino Minari. I, I started a GoFundMe account. And out of the blue, he was the first. I, it wasn't up an hour. He sent in $500. And then three months later, he sent me 67 boxes of all Jim Garrison's material that went to the House Select Committee. And I had to call him and thank him. And when I called him and thank him, I thought, he would, he's, he's a multimillionaire. He's got 11 businesses in Las Vegas. But he's addicted to Jim Garrison, JFK, and the fake media. And he wanted to help me with this film. And I could have never finished it without Gino Minari. Now, get this. Thursday, Pope people, and even though I, I love him, I, um, oh, gosh. Uh, uh, the uh, oh my gosh producer Tim yeah Tim Conway about five years ago I did Junior. Uh, yeah I, 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 with Tim Conway senior I did a uh, a CSI with him I co-star with him we played a Sunshine Boys comedy team and he murders me and it was terrific it was great working with him well, I, I heard about his son who had this great radio show in Los Angeles, most popular show in L.A., Tim Conway Jr. From, it's on KFI. It's from 6 at night till 10 at night. And he came on my show about three months ago. And we got along great. And he invited me on his show. But he was a little nervous about talking about this subject. So he has a sidekick on his show who does a show like you. They had me on. Anyway, 
I don't get mainstream exposure. I get this. But Donald Trump, his biggest victory was not over Hillary Clinton. His biggest victory was over the mainstream media, which supported Hillary Clinton. He won because of what you guys do. You're the alternative media. You are the social media. And what has happened? Let me tell you something. A lady, the lady who is the general manager of Pacifica Radio in Los Angeles. Pacifica is where Amy Goodman uh, does Democracy Now! out of New York, right? She saw my documentary privately. She said, I'm going to make, could, now we open on this coming Saturday, Friday in Los Angeles, uh, May 26. We are there for a week and I'm going to do Q&A Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday because people want to ask questions after the movie, and certainly I'm going to do that. She said, could we have a special screening for people who are donors to Pacifica Radio? And I said, yeah, so I'll set it up for Thursday. So I set it up for Thursday. I did an interview with Christine. They aired it three times and sold out. They had to stop airing the show because there were no more seats. We only have 250 seats. So Thursday, Brent, I go to Los Angeles. There will be 250 people who are listeners of KPFK, which is also where Pacifica is, where Mae Brussel started. Remember Mae Brussel? She was to broadcasting what Mark Lane was to publishing. She was by far the greatest research. She was only an accidental researcher. She's the granddaughter of the founder of iMagnon, Beverly Hills wealthy housewife with children, she believed the Warren Report, or she believed the government, until she saw Ruby shoot Oswald. Why does even... mainstream media ignore uh, something like this? And I'll tell you, we're running into a problem with social media as well. I don't know if you're aware of the YouTube ad boycott. Ah, yes, and I'll tell you how it started. Okay. Um, this show, and many others like it, have been hit. Our funding is zero now. They won't allow anything about JFK to have ads run underneath it. Yeah, and it's frightening. Right now I've got ghost shows that are making more money than my JFK shows, even though my JFK shows have 30, 40, 50,000 times the amount of views. It's embarrassing what YouTube has done and what they're doing. I'll Please, your you, comments. Okay, I'm going to tell you. I have a, felon, a friend of mine, David Lisby, just inherited a half a million dollars two years ago and moved his family to Thailand, his wife and child to Thailand because his wife is from Thailand. First of all, he was bothered by chemtrails in Vegas. And he said, John, we have media chemtrails, we have political chemtrails. This whole culture is polluted. So indeed he left. I'll tell you how smart he is with a computer. If you go to my website, by the way, which is brilliant, he did it all for nothing because he was such a fan of what it was what we were doing. So you can go to that and watch these great things. Anyway, when a thief was arrested in Las Vegas by the FBI and the thief trashed his computer or her computer so you couldn't track the data, they would call David and in would come David, take these bits and pieces and retrieve all the data. He sent me and he called me two weeks ago. He said, John, you just watched. They figured out a way to destroy alternative media with YouTube. And I said, how? And he, and he named a half dozen places. He said, John, there are 16-year-old kids and there are 60-year-old women who make 150000 or $200,000 a year because a million people watch what it is they put up there and they get Coca-Cola and they get Ford and they get Chrysler and they get all the beer commercials, okay? Two weeks ago, a site appeared that was unbelievably anti-black and anti-Semitic. I mean, really criminally bad. And guess what? It was filled with ads from Coca-Cola and Chrysler and Budweiser. And some reporter somehow mysteriously does a mainstream story about why is it that these major advertisers are advertising on something that is obviously criminal. And the next day, they pulled all of your ads and you don't know why they did it. That is how brilliant these people are.
are who have stolen our country. And it is all seen in the American media and the second assassination of President John F. Kennedy. It's going to be a week in L.A. It opens on the 9th of June in New York. I'll do the same thing there for Q&As afterwards. Now get this. In New York, there are only 62 seats. We've done no advertising. I called three weeks ago and asked one of the, uh, the employees at the theater, is there a place to stay close by? You know, I, I, I need a place that's kind of reasonable. And they said, is this John Barber? I said, yeah. And the guy got all excited. He said, you have no idea how many people are calling to come and see your movie. And there's no advertising. So it is word of mouth. So, I, you know, I predict that I would change the face of American television with real people. It got on NBC, and I did that. I have not had that feeling again until this documentary, except that I'm trying to restrain my enthusiasms because I know the mainstream media and the forces that own our country are going to try to keep this information from the people. So once we have, it's only in these two theaters because it's, I was denied a... Uh, an Oscar nomination for part one, which would have been a slam dunk because my partner had sold it to television without my saying anything before we got a film deal. Members of the Academy called me when they heard I was doing this and don't sell it to television. Get you two weeks in L.A. and New York and you will be eligible for an Oscar. Now, Brett, whether or not I get it, I don't care. At least it has a chance. Jim gets a chance to tell his story finally unfiltered. And nobody tells it better than he does. And I do not take an editorial position, even though I'm sardonic and humorous all the time. We allow these people, the Dan Rathers and the Wantha Cronkites and the Peter Jennings and all of them, to bury themselves with their own words and the facts. Damn, there's the music, my friend. I'm so sorry, oh, John. My God. Folks, you can find his website and all that information at our website. No worries. John, I want to thank you for coming on the show tonight. Best of luck. And we're going to put um, the links up where people can get your documentary. I'm Brett Holland. We'll see you all next time. Oh.